Welcome to our lecture on the inhalation anesthetics. So this presentation will focus more on the properties of the inhalant anesthetics, particularly uh, the properties such as the partition coefficient and the MAP or the minimum alveolar concentration. Inhaled anesthetics usually end in the word AIN, A -N -E, like uh, for example we have here the desflurane, halothane, isoflurane, and fluorine, sevoflurane, methoxyflurane, now with the exception of uh, one, which is the nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide is a special inhaled general anesthetic, and uh, most inhaled general anesthetics are derived from the ethyl ether. Now, the, the chemical formula of uh, the ethyl ether is shown in the diagram. So many years ago, people discovered that ether could put patients to sleep. Scientists then began modifying the molecule into modern anesthetics like isoflurane, which have the ether structure with the other atoms added. So we have here you know, the chemical structure of our diethyl ether, and we also have here the uh, isoflurane. In terms of the clinical effects, there are two key properties that determine the effect of a general anesthetic. One is the blood solubility, the other is the lipid solubility. The solubility of a gaseous anesthetic is what determines the onset and offset time of the inhaled anesthetic drugs. And the idea here is that the molecules of a gas that are dissolved in blood have no anesthetic effect, but molecules that are not dissolved in blood can produce the anesthetic effect. Uh, of course, that is through the effects on the brain. So initially, when the gas gets into the bloodstream, it will be soaked up by the blood. And you need to saturate the blood before undissolved gaseous molecules will start to accumulate. And it's those undissolved ones that can produce the clinical effects. This means that if an anesthetic gas has a very high solubility in blood, it's going to have a longer to have effect you know, because the blood is going to soak up lots of the gas molecules and very few of them will be found in a gaseous form undissolved in the blood, you know, where they can exert a clinical effect. So the higher the blood solubility of a certain anesthetic gas, the longer it would also for it to take its effect. We have here the diagram showing the uh, concentration of the, again, the blood you now having the anesthetic gas. And we also have here the, 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 the gas you know, showing the anesthetic gases. So again, the blood uh, concentration of our anesthetic has no anesthetic effect, while the, those that are present in the gas have the good effect or the anesthetic effect. To make this clear, let's imagine that we have here some blood uh, shown in this figure, and we have a little bit of space for air above the blood. And we began introducing the anesthesia gas molecules from the lungs. So initially, all the molecules are going to be soaked up by the blood. But, uh, of course, as shown in this diagram, but as we, uh, but if we keep move pumping you know, more molecules, anesthesia gas, the blood will eventually become saturated. And then we will start to get some undissolved molecules in this area. If we keep pumping in anesthesia, we will get lots of undissolved molecules of the anesthetic. The way we measure the undissolved gas molecules is by determining the partial pressure of the anesthetic gas. So the partial pressure is only going to really begin to rise once you fully saturate the blood. And that's why the blood solubility is so important to the onset of the action of the gaseous anesthetics. So putting all this together, if an anesthetic gas has high blood solubility, that means that it has a tendency to stay in the blood. And it, uh, it will also take uh, a longer time to saturate the blood so that the partial pressure will begin to rise. Clinically, this means that an anesthetic gas with high blood solubility is going to have a slower induction time and will take longer to induce anesthesia and put the patient to sleep and also a slower washout time because in order to put the patient to sleep you have to put lots of gas molecules in the body and it takes a long time for those to wash out.
The opposite is true for anisaric gases that have low blood solubility. The blood can hold many molecules of these gases, so the blood quickly becomes saturated with as much gas as it can hold. This leads to the partial pressure rising rapidly and quick effects being exerted on the brain. Hence, anesthetic gases with a low blood solubility have a shorter induction time, they are more quickly to put the patient to sleep, and they also wash out faster. The way we measure the blood solubility of an gaseous anesthetic is by determining a number for that drug called the blood gas partition coefficient. For example, for the inhaled anesthetic isoflurane, the blood gas partition coefficient is 1.4. This means at any point in time, there will, there will be 1.4 molecules dissolved in blood for every molecule or for every one molecule that is in the gaseous form in the alveoli. So different inhaled anesthetics have different blood gas partition coefficients. Those that have a very high coefficient have high solubility in the blood. And so, as we have just discussed, those drugs will take longer to induce anesthesia and also longer to wash out at the end of the case. Conversely, drugs with a low partition coefficient have a low solubility in blood. These drugs will be more quickly to induce anesthesia and they will also more quickly to wash out of the body when you stop giving the drug. Shown on this slide is the table of the blood gas partition coefficients for some inhalant anesthetics. So we'll start with halothane. Now, so for halothane, it has a relatively high blood gas partition coefficient. So this means that it has a high solubility in the blood. And if you use halothane to induce anesthesia, it will take a long time and there will be a slow induction. By the same logic, if you use halothane during anesthesia case, it will take longer to wash out, and that is because of the high blood solubility. In contrast, nitrous oxide has a relatively very low blood gas partition coefficient. This means its anesthetic effects are very quick in onset. In addition, at the end of the case, when you stop giving nitrous oxide, it will wash out very quickly as well. And this is all because of its low blood solubility. After the slide, where we talked about how the two key properties of an inhalant gas anesthetic um, determine its clinical effects. We just talked about the blood solubility which determines the onset and offset time you know, for gaseous anesthetic agents. Now we are going to talk about the lipid solubility. Uh, lipid solubility is very important because this determines the potency and that lets you know what concentration of gas you should administer to the patient. Solubility is the affinity of a gaseous anesthetic for lipids. The more lipid soluble a gas anesthetic is, the more easily it will diffuse into the brain. And therefore, anesthetic gases with a high lipid affinity are more potent. Now, this is sometimes called the mayer overton rule, named for the people who first describe it. So, for example, an anesthesiologist is putting a patient to sleep for surgery. The anesthesiologist can control the concentration of a gas that the patient inhales. So, if he could administer a 5% of an inhaled anesthetic to a patient, or the anesthesiologist could also administer 50% now of the inhaled anesthetic to the patient. If the inhaled anesthetic is very potent, then 5% may be enough to put the patient to sleep, and 50% could be so much that it kills the patient. On the other hand, if the gaseous anesthetic is not very potent, then 5% may have no effect at all, and you may need 50% just to put the patient to sleep. So this concept of the uh, potency is very useful clinically because it tells us what percentage of a gas to administer to the patient so they will uh, go to sleep. And potency is related to the lipid solubility of the drug. Hence, when you have a high lipid affinity of a gas, it's more potent. And that means that 
a lower gas concentration will be required to produce an anesthetic effect. And one of the ways to describe the lipid solubility of various gaseous anesthetic is by what's known as the oil gas partition coefficient. Shown in this slide is a table with the oil gas partition coefficient for some inhaled anesthetics. Halothane has a very high oil gas partition coefficient. This means that it is very potent. You will need a low concentration of halothane in order to put a patient to sleep. In contrast, nitrous oxide has a very low oil gas partition coefficient. You will need a very high concentration of nitrous oxide in order to put the patient to sleep. And so this is how the oil gas partition coefficient helps us understand the various potency of the different gaseous anesthetics. So lipid solubility you know, is nice for describing potency, but anesthesiologists can control you know, the concentration of the gas that the patient inhales. So really what we wanted to know is not the lipid solubility, but the minimum alveolar or the minimum concentration that we need to use in order to put the patient to sleep. And for this, we use a different measurement of gas potency called the minimum alveolar concentration or the MAC. The minimum alveolar concentration is the concentration of a gas. For example, we have here 1%, 5%, or 10%. This is a concentration that will prevent movement in 50% of subjects in response to pain. So this is considered to be a very useful parameter in clinical practice because it determines the concentration of a gas to administer to the patient in order to achieve the desired effect or the desired anesthetic effect. So each inhaled anesthetic has its own MAC and those that have a low MAC would require a low gas concentration to put the patient to sleep for surgery. So drugs with a low MAC have a high potency. In contrast, drugs with a high MAC require a high gas concentration to achieve an anesthetic effect. These are low potency drugs. So because the MAC of a drug describes its potency, MAC is going to be related to lipid solubility. But unlike the oil gas partition coefficient, where the higher the coefficient, the higher the lipid solubility, in the case of MAC, it's an inverse relationship. So drugs that have very high lipid solubility have a very low MAC and vice versa. Here in the table, we talk about two sides ago. Uh, but instead of just showing you know, the oil gas partition coefficient, we also added the minimum of dollar concentration. So, uh, for example, you could see you know, that the halothane has a very high, of course, you know, a very high oil gas partition, partition coefficient, meaning that it is a very potent and lipid soluble gas. It has a very low MAC. So the, the relationship is inverse. So in contrast, we also have the nitrous oxide, which was not very lipid soluble. So it, it has a low oil gas partition coefficient. Um, nitrous oxide has a very high MAC. You know? So uh, this means that even if we administer 100% you know, of our nitrous oxide to a patient, we would be able to achieve no response to pain in 50% of the subjects. One of the reasons it's nice to use the map is because it helps us to understand you know, what concentration of a drug to give to the patient. But another nice thing about describing inhaled anesthetic spider map is that the properties are considered to be additive. If you decide to use, for example, two drugs together. So for example, sometimes uh, one of the inhaled anesthetics like sevoflurane will be mixed with nitrous oxide. This will allow us you know, to use a lower concentration of each drug. And when you do this, you now the MAC of the two drugs are additive. So uh, another property of the inhaled anesthetics is that when you are going to use uh, two drugs, their um, MAC are considered to be additive. 
And of course, when you are going to use you know, two, two drugs with a lower dose, the patient will be exposed to less of each drug and there will be a lower risk of adverse effects. Here's a summary uh, of the important properties of the inhaled anesthetics. So the onset of action in the washout of the inhaled anesthetic is related to the blood gas partition coefficient. The higher the coefficient, the slower the onset of uh, the action and the slower would also be the washout. This all ties back to the solubility of the gas in the blood. The more soluble the gas in the blood, the slower is the onset and the slower would also be the wash out. Uh, we also have here the potency. So potency is a different thing. Potency is related to the oil gas partition coefficient. So the higher you know, the partition coefficient, the more potent the drug is. And this is also related to the solubility of the gas in the lipids. Drugs that are more soluble in lipids are considered to be more potent. Uh, and then we remember you know, that we talk about potency so in terms of the MAC. The lower the MAC, the lower the MAC, the more potent you know, the, the gas is for putting the patient to sleep. So to conclude our presentation about general anesthesia, we can break down the stages of anesthesia into the induction stage, the maintenance stage, and the emergent stage. So in the induction stage, uh, we use you know, drugs to put the patient to sleep. Usually, these are the intravenous drugs like propofol, uh, sometimes together with an opioid like fentanyl. In the modern era, inhaled drugs are very rarely ever used you know, to induce anesthesia. They were used decades ago, but now that we have more effective intravenous drugs, those which are usually injected into a vein to quickly put the patient to sleep. So once the patient is asleep from the IV drug, the anesthesiologist will often administer you know, a paralytic agent so that the patient you know, can be paralyzed and more easily intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation. Because note that many of these anesthetic drugs cause respiratory depression. So usually patients need to be intubated and mechanically ventilated while under anesthesia. In the maintenance phase, the drugs are administered to keep the patient asleep. This is when inhaled anesthetics are sometimes used, although um, intravenous drugs can also be used, or sometimes in combination of the inhaled and the intravenous drugs. So sometimes there are also going you know, to use uh, paralytics, um, during the maintenance phase. So the maintenance phase will depend heavily on the surgery for quick operations. There may be no maintenance drugs necessary. For very long operations, lots of maintenance drugs will be needed. Then we have our emergence phase. So this is when the patient emerges from the anesthesia. This is when the anesthetics are discontinued. So reversal of the uh, neuromuscular blockade is also sometimes done and the patient is allowed to wake up and eventually extubated. And that concludes our topic on the general anesthesia.